West, and on his paternal side, he hails from Antigonish and Inverness County. Michael is a graduate of Monica Regional High School, and after spending some time with the Navy, he returned to pursue his studies in Edinburgh, Scotland. And he graduated in uh, 1995 with his doctorate in Celtic studies. The focus of his thesis uh, in Edinburgh was immigration from the Scottish Highlands and settlement in Prince Edward Island. Tonight, Dr. Kennedy is going to discuss the Scots and the Irish as at one time sharing a common culture and some of the stresses and strains that that col common culture has endured over the years. I invite you now to sit back and relax and enjoy Dr. Michael Kennedy. everybody. Thank you all for coming. With these two microphones, I hope at least one of them will be working tonight. When I was studying in Scotland, I attended a book launch by Michael and Dachi, and he was hooked up with a, a microphone, something like this, and as he was being hooked up, he started telling a story of a book launch he'd been at a couple of years before. A Canadian author was going to read from her works, but she came down with food poisoning or some kind of touch of the stomach flu or something. But she didn't want to let the organizers down, so she decided she'd try to get through it as best she could. She was sitting up on the stage and being introduced, and she was getting paler and paler and paler. And suddenly she realized she wasn't going to make it even through the introduction. So she leapt off the stage, raced into the bathroom. She proceeded to get violently ill. <laughs> while she was being sick, she heard somebody come racing in after her, up to the stall and rap on the door. And as sick as she was, she was very touched by the, the show of concern until the person said, excuse me, do you think you could shut off your microphone? <laughs> <laughs> so George, if I turn pale and make a run for the door, you know what your job is. <laughs> well, several years ago uh, in Halifax, I was introduced to a federal civil servant and she just had a really frustrating day dealing with bilingualism and her limited French. So when we shook hands, she smiled with obvious relief and she said, Kennedy, now that's a good English name. <laughs> I said, whether it's good or not, I said, I said, I can't really say, but it's definitely not English, it's Gaelic. And she looked at me with a little impatience and said, yeah, but it's not French. <laughs> Well, I thanked her for that revelation. It was kind of an interesting characterization to be un-French, an Englishman by, by default. But her point was well made all the same. And I'd like to just do a little straw poll here. I'm going to ask you two questions, and I, I won't harass you anymore tonight. But I'd like everybody here that has Scottish or Irish ancestry just to put their hand up. Okay, now I'm going to ask you another question. Making allowances for my kind of poor handwriting there. Those are the surnames of my four grandparents. Now I'll ask, ask you again, how many of you here would be confident in picking out Kennedy? How, how many of you don't think you know which, which one is Kennedy? First name is Cameron, that's C-A-M-S-R-O-N. The second one is McDonald. The third one is McKay, and the last one is McCulric, or Kennedy, as we also know it. I entitled this evening's lecture, The Scots and Irish, One People, and I placed a question mark at the end to underline the present state of erosion of our sense of a common Scottish and Irish Gaelic identity. Now, I might well have placed the question mark after the words Scots or Irish themselves, as our respective individual sense of the Gaelic identity of being either Scottish or Irish has also eroded desperately. Now this claim may surprise you, so I'll just give you a quick example of what I mean. When the first British, cen British census of Prince Edward Island was carried out in 1798, Scottish Highlanders, or Scottish Gaels as they should be called, very ne nearly outnumbered all other ethnic groups combined. 
Roughly 100 years later, in 1881, when the first Canadian census was conducted, Prince, uh, Scots, the vast majority of whom were Gales, still accounted for almost half the population. Now this is a map of the Scottish Highland settlements, and about 95% of this area, the people would have been Gaelic speaking, and Gaelic speaking only. Now, at this time, this is sort of 19th century Prince Edward Island, at this time, an additional 25% of the population of the island was of Irish ancestry. So that means at the time of Confederation, roughly 70% of the population of Prince Edward Island claimed Gaelic, uh, Gaelic ancestry. In fact, I, I discovered recently, looking at some newspapers in the United States, that in the early decades of this century, Prince Edward Islanders were considered to be so Gaelic in their personality and, and background that uh, Islanders working in the main lumberwoods were often referred to collectively as the Rorys, from the common Gaelic forename Rory. Yet today, PEI is very far from being seen as a Gaelic island. Tourist brochures, sponsored by the PEI government, inform visitors that Prince Edward Island's population is predominantly of English ancestry, with only discrete groups of French, Scottish, and Irish among its population. Similarly, the Canadian Ethnic Studies Association bluntly states that with the small exception of its Acadian population, Prince Edward Island, like Nova Scotia, is historically and demographically, uniculturally and unilingually English. So how did we go from there to here? From an island so obviously steeped in, one might even say defined by Gaelic culture, to an island in which a Gaelic ancestry and cultural base is denied by some at least, even to have, ever to have existed at all. When we look at the 1991 census, we get part of the answer. Remarkably, the Scottish and Irish populations combined is now actually smaller than the population of English ancestry. I say claiming because there is much more to the story than just a real decline in the Gaelic population. From the turn of the century, the Scottish and Irish population of PEI declined very slowly, about 13,000 by 1961. In 1971, however, the year of Canada's first self-enumerating census, that portion of the population revealed a further dramatic drop of 13,000 in one decade alone. Now, this was a Canadian-wide trend that really startled statisticians. They concluded that, quote, it is apparent that significant numbers of persons reported in the Irish, Scottish, and Welsh categories in 1961 must have been reported as English in 1971. Sufficient analysis has not been possible to determine the cause of this unexpected trend. My original intention for this evening's lecture was to directly address this dramatic change in our sense of identity, to examine what has happened here in Prince Edward Island to our Gaelic culture and our sense of self. But in order to understand where we are now, it's important to understand where we have been. And I soon realized that even a superficial kind of treatment of this entire topic would have been a very large undertaking and probably would have required you to remain seated for the equivalent of the entire Star Wars trilogy. <laughs> well, I think the story is every bit as, as interesting. I'm afraid my special effects would be quite a disappointment. Instead, I've decided to concentrate tonight on tracing the evolution of our common Gaelic heritage in order to determine how the seeds of Gaelic decline were sown, the seeds of our present dilemma of identity how that tragic harvest was reaped in Prince Edward Island and what challenges it presents to us today will have to be the subject of future discussion. <coughs> the first reference to our Gaelic ancestors is a fairly dramatic one. In 297 AD, a nervous Roman chronicler described a series of devastating attacks being launched against Roman-controlled territory in the British Isles by people known to the Romans as the Scotsi, or as we would call them in English, the Scots. They were launching their assault from across the Irish Sea, attacking along the entire western and southern frontiers of Britain, 
and sweeping into the northern mainland to launch joint, joint strikes with the Picts. This is the territory of the Picts to the north here, to the north of Scotland. This is the border between Scotland and England. The Britons, the Celtic tribes closely related to the Picts and inhabiting the Roman-controlled British mainland now under attack, knew the Scotsi as the Gaetel, or Gaels. The Scots and the Gaels, in other words, were one and the same people, the inhabitants of Ireland. By the time the Roman Empire began its final collapse in the 5th century, with the Anglo-Saxons pouring into Britain from the east as their fellow German tribes overran continental Europe to the south, the Gaels had already carved out a stable and distinct kingdom on the British mainland. This kingdom was known as Dalriata, and its rough extent is even to this day known as Argyll, from the Gaelic Edagale, meaning the coastland or boundary of the Gaels. And again, you can see these areas here, these areas here were all absorbed by the local population. That area there is Dalria to the, the one kingdom that survived out of the, the original tax. That the Gaels did not remain restricted to this boundary is immediately obvious from the fact that the entire northern region of Britain came to be named Scotland, the land of the Gaels, on their behalf. But it is also obvious from more local place names, such as Athol, in the geographical centre of Scotland. Athol, which was once a place name here in Prince Edward Island as well, not too far from where we are here in Lot 34 along the St. Peter's Road, is actually composed of two Gaelic words, a ah and fatla. And of course, people will be familiar with the name fatla from the Irish districts around Iona as well. Fatla is an ancient poetic name for Ireland. A ah, fatla means, in effect, New Ireland. So it's clear that they cr quickly stamped stamped their character right in the middle of the new country of Scotland. The collapse of the Roman Empire, which coincided with this period of Gaelic expansion, plunged Europe into what is known as the Dark Ages, a period when Roman civic organization, peace, literacy, <coughs> classical learning, and Christianity were largely destroyed in Europe. Such was decidedly not the case in the Gaeltacht, however as the Gaelic world soon came to be seen as a shining light of civilization. The Gaels had an ancient and highly sophisticated system of learning, and although never conquered or even occupied by the Romans, they did have contact with them and borrowed liber liberally from what they considered to be the best intellectual material Roman civilization had to offer. Following the Roman collapse, the Gaelic conversion to Christianity became more rapid and more complete and they were to play an important role in converting the Picts and the Anglo-Saxons as well, and in guiding the recovery and evolution of the Christian Church throughout Europe. Further, they became the first people in Europe, other than the Greeks and Romans, to write in their own language, and they did so centuries before English was first written, making, Gaelic, making the Gaelic world one of the most important centers of spirituality and learning in the Christian world. It is not too much to say that the politi political successes the Gaels had, expanding into the British mainland, was it were attributable both to their strong internal administrative and military organization, as well as this, to this intellectual heritage, which inspired respect and an interest in emulating Gaelic ways among their neighbors. We begin to form an understanding of the importance of this Gaelic intellectual tradition by examining what was perhaps the most significant event in the Dark Age Gaeltach. That was the arrival of Columcilla, or St. Columba, in Iona, a tiny island off the coast of Mull, which even to this day is known as E. Columcilla, St. Columba's Island. It would be difficult to pick a more perfect representative of this dynamic, expanding society than Columcilla. Although best known as St. Columba, 
Holm was a member of the Gaelic warrior aristocracy, specifically a member of the powerful O'Neill trial of Northern Ireland. He was also a gifted scholar, and it was his background as a scholar and as a member of this warrior class which was to see him leave Ireland in exile to devote his life to the church. Colum initiated what may well be the first recorded court battle over copyright by making a copy of the Psalms from an original owned by St. Finian, his mentor, without the latter's knowledge. Now, such scribal copying was normal for scholars, but attempting to keep the copy, as Colum did, was not, and a court battle ensued. The case went against Colum with the famous judgment, every cow its, co every cow its calf and every book its copy a judgment which so infuriated Colum that he brought his northern tribesmen, the O'Neill, to arms on his behalf. Later, when cooler heads prevailed, the gravity of his error in judgment was realized, and it seems he accepted a period of temporary exile among his kinsmen in British Dalriata. And from this somewhat less than holy beginning, one of the most important centers in the Christian church was established. A sense of Colum Kelia, the saint, scholar, and Gale, and the importance of Iona as a center of spirituality and learning were poignantly captured in a Gaelic poem composed about the year 600, lamenting Colum's death. This may well be the oldest piece of Gaelic writing, and as such is possibly the first piece of literature ever written in Europe in other, any language other than Latin or Greek. And this is just a tiny fragment of it. He was learning's pillar, in every stronghold. He was foremost at the book of complex law. The northern land shone, the western people blazed. He lit up the east with chaste clerics. Good is the legacy of God's angel when he glorified him. Now the poet's words were no exaggeration, for under the impetus of Colum Killa, Iona very much came to be seen as a shining light in the darkness of Europe. It was in Iona that the famous illuminated manuscript, the Book of Kells, was believed to have been made, and that an influential school of beautiful stone carving emerged. There, too, that scholarship flourished, evident in such works as Adamnon's Law of the Innocents, ratified in the year 697. This was possibly the first law ever enacted which protected non-combatants, such as women, children, and clerics, both from violence during periods of war and from enforced military service. The fact that it was signed by many of the most important religious leaders and kings in Ireland and Scotland is testament both to the diplomacy and influence of the monks of Iona, as well as to their concern with the concerns of their fellow men. Iona was no ivory tower. This was a golden age for Gaelic culture and scholars flocked to Iona and to other Gaelic centers of learning. The Anglo-Saxon scholar, the Venerable Bede, claimed that in the late century, many English nobles and lesser folk had gone to Ireland to study and contemplate, and that, quote, the Irish welcomed them all kindly and without asking for any payment, provided them with daily food, books, and instruction, unquote. This influence was by no means limited to centers of learning in Ireland and Scotland, or to scholars from the British Isles, however. Gaelic learning and spirituality were famed on a European scale. And Gaels came to play a prominent part in the foundation of similar sites of learning and Christianity throughout the continent, truly earning for Ireland the title, the land of the saints and scholars. These are monastic sites of learning, similar to Iona, that, that were founded roughly between the years 700 and 1000 throughout most of Europe, even into the Ukraine, which is not on this map. As the Gaelic world enjoyed this period of intellectual and spiritual richness, a new and far more violent age of violent battles was about to be unleashed, as a new pagan people suddenly burst forth to rock Europe to its foundations. The single most quoted stanza concerning these new terrifying peoples comes from a poem penned by a Gaelic scholar in which he praises the savage weather he would normally curse for the protection it provides him. Quote, 
Bitter is the wind tonight. It tosses the sea's white hair. I do not fear the wild warriors of Norway who course on a quiet sea." Unquote. With the sacking of the Gaelic monasteries of Iona and Lindisfarne starting about the year 790, the Vikings erupted onto the European scene. For over 200 years, the Vikings would be one of the most dominating forces in the West, raiding and plundering, as well as establishing settlements and trading centers as far south as Sicily. The nearby lands of the Gales, with their rich and undefended monastic sites, were a prime target for such activity, and the Norsemen took full advantage. During this period, Iona was evacuated and re-established in Kells in Ireland, where it could be better protected. This is, incidentally, how the Book of Kells came to be in Ireland, and obviously how it got its name. The Norse presence in the Western Isles of Scotland was so heavy that the Outer Hebrides became known in Gaelic as Inche Gaul, the land or the islands of the non-Gaels. Similarly, Vikings established important trading centers around Long Ireland's coast, founding such cities as Dublin, Waterford, Wexford, Cork, and Limerick. And I'll just point out in the map the main areas of Viking influence. These are the Western Isles here. They pretty much entirely came under Norse domain during this period. These are the centers they found in Ireland for trade, Dublin, Wexford, Waterford, Cork, and up here in Limerick. The struggles of the Gaels during this period, particularly against the Vikings, spawned a remarkable body of literature known as the Fenian Cycle or the Ossianic Tales. As one scholar commented, the traditional favorites of the storyteller's audience in the cultural unit formed by the Gaelthats of Scotland and Ireland were the Fenian tales, recounting the adventures of the legendary warrior Fionn Mac Cool and his band of followers. These formed the chief epic of Gaelic literature since the Middle Ages and were equal importance to the Kalevala in Finland. Such was the Highland Gael's reverence towards the Fenian tales that men often removed their bonnets during their recitation. The Fenians were a legendary band of warriors who defended both Ireland and Scotland from all invaders, particularly the Vikings. Many tales from the Fenian cycle were recorded in medieval Irish texts, but for the most part they have been passed down orally, and what is arguably most remarkable, remarkable about these very remarkable tales is that 1,000 years after they were first composed, they are still recited by Gaelic speakers in Canada an extraordinary example of literary survival which I believe is unparalleled in Western European culture. <coughs> this, for example, is Patrick McEachern of Glendale, Cape Breton, or as he would be called in his own language, Padrick Inishien Echgon Le Fadric Van Echgon Padrick, the son of Angus John, the son of Donald, son of fair-haired Patrick, the son of Ronald. Now here in his kitchen in Gaelic, he is reciting the Fenian tale, Marhuur Oscar de Vain, how Oscar found his wife. And he starts out, uh, this is the English translation on the front. Well, once upon a time in the old country, likely it was in Ireland long ago, there was a king and he had three sons, Oscar, Ossian, and Fionn. On this night, a weird form, she was half fish, half woman, came to Fionn's tent. It seems ironic that these stories, in which Ireland features so prominently, are recited today in Canada not by the Irish, but by Scots. But this is a distinction more apparent than real, for it is Gaels who tell these stories, and the Fenian heroes very much symbolize the linked Gaelic world of Scotland and Ireland. Even to this day, the term for fair play among Gaels refers to these ancient heroes, Coram the Fenian, the chants of the Fenians. That these legends of the defenders of Ireland and Scotland maintain such resonance for Gaels is indicative of the role they have played as symbols of our shared Gaelic culture. Well, whether it was due to the prowess of the Fenians or not, the Vikings, in spite of their excellent organizational skills and their widely feared ferocity, met their match in the Gaels. 
It was, in fact, during the Viking era that the Gaels exploded out of Dalriata to absorb Pictland before pushing their borders south of the first of Forth and Clyde to, observe, to absorb the Britons of the west and the Anglo-Saxons of the east. They pushed their borders first through here so, so that they had this entire part of the country under their, their control, except for the islands which were which mixed with Norway. This area was occupied by the people known as the Britons, the ancestors of the modern Welsh. And they had been pushed back by the Anglo-Saxons in the south as well into modern Wales. The eastern part of the country from Edinburgh here down to the border was part of the, the huge English influx from the territories in the mainland of Europe. By the beginning of the 11th century, the Gaels of Ireland, under the High King Brian Boru, destroyed Viking power in Ireland. It is true that in, in it is true that the Irish king's counterpart, the King of Scots, now based in the east, his, his kingdom capital went from Edinburgh on the south part of the Firth to just north of the Firth in the borderlands of Persia. It is true that he had lost sway in Argyll and the islands to the Norse, but a new dynasty arose in the former kingdom of Dalriata, which effectively broke the Norse hold on this territory in the 12th century. Sonla nach Gilevrige, the son of a Norse princess and a Gaelic king, who traced his ancestry back to Neil of the Nine Hostages and Con of the Hundred Battles, the eponymous ancestors of the O'Neill of Northern Ireland and of Columcilla, established himself as the King of Argyll and the Islands, or as the Lord of the Isles, as we know the title today. He was the progenitor of three of the most powerful Scottish clans, the MacDougals of Lorne, who would become the first Lords of the Isles, the MacDonalds, who would supersede them, and the MacWarries, who are now extinct. Their legacy was one of Gaelic political and cultural resurgence in the west of Scotland. This era, the dawning of the millennium, was also effectively the dawning of the nation state in Europe. And it was here in a sense that we see the birth of the modern nations of Scotland and Ireland. But although there are clear signs of an evolving sense of political distinctiveness, the sense of a shared identity remained strong. Scottish historian David Broom explains, quote, when Scotland and the Scots were created circa 900, they did not cease to identify themselves as Gaels. According to their origin legend in the 10th century Shenicus Fernalopin, and that means the history of the men of Scotland and Scotland being the mainland of Northern Britain in this case, they continue to see themselves as originating in Ireland and they, or certainly at least the illiterati, would have been conscious of being one people with their fellow Gaelic speakers in Ireland. Their political identity, if you like, was as Scots, while their ethnic or racial identity was as Gaels. Now you might, have expect, you might expect that this shared identity with the Irish would have died out fairly soon among the upper echelons of society in Scotland proper, once they ceased to speak Gaelic. From what I have found out about the accounts of Scottish origins written in the 13th century, however, this was not the case. On the contrary, not only did accounts of Scottish origins continue to repeat the umbilical link with Ireland, but there were two accounts, one certainly and one probably written in the 13th century, which sought to make the Irish connection more emphatic." Unquote. Although David Broome's account emphasizes the continued sense of shared identity between Ireland and Scotland, late into the 13th century, in spite of a growing political separateness, an ominous question hangs over the account. Why were the upper echelons of 13th century Scottish society ceasing to speak Gaelic, the native language of Scotland? Although in many ways the Gaelic world gave a great promise as it entered the new millennium, it was about to begin a long, painful, and disastrous decline. A decline which would see a physical retreat of the Gaelic world, the destruction of its society even in its heartland, the denial of Scotland's Irish ancestry, and the denigration of Gaelic history and culture as worthless and barbaric. 
Propaganda which still hangs over our heads today, I'm afraid to say. Ironically, the impetus for this change of fortune came not from the conquest of the Gaels, but of the Anglo-Saxons. In 1066, invading from France, the Normans carried out an amazing and virtually complete conquest of England, bringing to the doorstep of the Gaelic world the most effective and ruthless administrative and military machine in Europe. The kings of Scots felt sufficiently secure in their domain to actually launch campaigns in disputed territory in the north of England at this time, but they also welcomed large numbers of refugee Anglo-Saxon nobles, as well as Normans, into the kingdom. This interaction and the aggression f from England which later followed was the forerunner of Gaelic's long decline in Scotland. The decline in Ireland began in a more classical fashion when 100 years later Henry II sought the approval to launch an invasion from, from England from Pope Adrian IV, conveniently the only English Pope in the history of the Catholic Church. According to Gerald of Wales, he asked permission, quote, to enter the island of Ireland in order to subject its people to law and to root out from them the weeds of vice, to enlarge the boundaries of the church and to proclaim the truths of the Christian religion to a rude and ignorant people, unquote. The Normans bolstered their case for mounting a civilizing mission to Ireland by claiming that Irish clerics were obviously not truly committed to Christianity since they had failed to produce even one Christian martyr in Ireland's entire religious history. This was responded to with due and prophetic sarcasm by the Archbishop of Cashel. It is true that although our people are very barbarous, uncivilized, and savage, nevertheless they have always play, paid great honor and reverence to churchmen and they have never put out their hands against the saints of God. But now a people has come to the kingdom which knows how and is accustomed to make martyrs. From now on, Ireland will have its martyrs just as other countries. Now it may seem bizarre that the Vatican should give permission to launch a full-scale military attack on the land of the saints and scholars. The Gaels had, after all, not only just completed a massive reorganization of the poetic profession the bulwark of the Gaelic intellectual world, they had also just completed a prescriptive grammar of the Gaelic language, the first such linguistic work ever attempted in any European language. And similar developments in the intellectual and artistic spheres of the church were also well underway. But in the highly politicized world of medieval Europe, such considerations were easily overlooked and the English were given permission to carry out their holy work. Although this intrusive face of growing English strength would spell doom for the Gaelic world, the initial wave of Norman penetration had a rather odd result. The Normans went native. Just as their Viking ancestors had done, had become French after settling in Normandy, and the Norman invaders of England were in the process of becoming English, many of the Normans in Scotland and Ireland became Gaels. This was less apparent in Scotland, where a central native Gaelic government had long been established in the southern area of the country, which was now most under the influence of its southern English neighbor. However, over 100 years after the invasion of Ireland, when the ancient Scottish Gaelic dynasty of kings became extinct in the late 13th century, and the kingdom was plunged into the Scottish Wars of Independence, the King of England's attempts to subject Scotland to English rule were crushed by just such a Gaelic Norman, Robert Bruce, the new King of Scots. Bruce was the son both of a Norman knight, whose family had been in Scotland for four generations, and of a Gaelic princess, whose family roots were lost in Gaelic antiquity in Scotland and in Ireland. The Declaration of Arboth in 1320, which was composed as a result of Scotland's successful military campaigns against England under Bruce's leadership, was one of the Western world's first powerful declarations of nationhood. The Scots, who had fared no better than their Irish cousins, having been excommunicated by the Pope for resisting the English, were seeking to justify to an international audience Scotland's right to an existence independent of England. And even here, the precedents cited were Scotland's Gaelic king lists and Gaelic origin myths. 
Scotland was portrayed as independent of England by virtue of its Gaelic heritage and sovereignty. The Declaration of Arbolth, however, however, was the first Scottish historical document which failed to mention Ireland as the ancestral home of the Scots. Now, while this probably does reflect to a certain extent a growing sense of Scottish political nationalism, it must be remembered that if the Declaration had cited Ireland as that ancestral homeland, it would have largely undermined their argument for independence from England, for at this time, most of Eastern Ireland was occupied by the English and the entire island was under their claim. The ties to Ireland at, the, at this time, the Declaration of Arbroath notwithstanding, were nonetheless very, very strong. Robert the Bruce himself had been born and brought up in the <coughs> Scottish Gaelic district of Carrick within sight of Ireland. This area here, you can see how close that border is here, so it's two miles across. His brother Edward had been fostered in traditional Gaelic fashion with the O'Neill in Ireland, who we've met several times already. During the Wars of Independence, both campaigned in the English-controlled territories of Ireland. And although Edward's proclamation as King of Ireland was somewhat spurious, since the Scots had actually failed to drive the English from, from Ireland, they did manage both to keep the Anglo-Irish out of their own battles with England, and they re-strengthened re the traditional ties between Scotland and, in, er, and Ireland. One such act of re-strengthening was Bruce's confirmation of Unus Alt Domalach, young Angus MacDonald, as the Lord of the Isles, greatly expanding the Lordship's power and responsibility. Unus Alt himself strength, strengthened Irish and Scottish ties substantially when he took an Irish by, bride and received the most famous wedding present in Gaelic history, the Tochlet Nien O'Cahan, or O'Cain's daughter's diary, dowry. The dowry consisted of a bodyguard of 130 men to settle in Nunasag's territory, and these were men of no little distinction. Families such as the clan Macbeha, the hereditary physicians of Akadawi, were among the retainers, and the first of their number in Scotland, Padraig Macbeha, lost no time in finding employment as the personal physician of the King of Scots, Robert Bruce. The Macbeha family eventually had their name Latinized to Beaton, and you'll find evidence of their Scottish descendants here in Prince Edward Island in the place names Beaton Point in eastern PEI and the Beaton Road in the west. In the 14th century then, the Western Isles had been transferred to Scotland from the Norse. <coughs> the Scots had defeated the English in battle and secured their southern border. Gaelic linkages between Scotland and Ireland were being shored up and the two countries seemed as if they might be ready to continue their evolution towards modern nationhood. Such was not to be the case, however. In the wake of the Scottish Wars of Independence, the English enacted the Statutes of Kilkenny in an attempt to halt the Gaelic political resurgence in Ireland, as well as the cultural assimilation of the Norman Knights who had settled there. The Statutes, in effect, enacted an anti-Gaelic system of apartheid in Ireland, Anyone in the English-controlled territories of the Pale, or the Englishry, as they were called, was threatened with complete forfeiture of their lands and all their goods, for having virtually any sort of positive contact with Gaels and their apparently subversive culture. It should perhaps also be pointed out that the English saying, beyond the Pale, meaning beyond civilization, has its roots in the anti-Gaelic sentiments of this period. Among other things, the statutes prohibited intermarriage between English and Irish, banned the Irish from churches in English areas, and forbade the English settlers from speaking Gaelic, receiving Gaelic entertainers, and adopting Gaelic forms of dress or other customs. No such legislation was enacted against Scotland, but the English immediately broke the, the peace treaty of 1328 and continually invaded the south of Scotland over the next several centuries, slowly but surely turning the centers of power in Scotland into a version of the Irish Pale and swinging them securely into England's cultural and political orbit. In spite of the obvious tension, the Gaelic West of Scotland had a remarkable sense of security in this era following the collapse of Viking power. This is evident in the name they gave the era. 
Ling and I, the Age of Prosperity. Under the domain of the powerful Macdonald Lords of the Isles, Gaelic culture was flourishing, and the pathways between Ireland and Scotland were wide open and heavily traveled. New Gaelic families came to preeminence as political leaders in the West, while scholars, churchmen, and artists received generous patronage from the great Gaelic families of the day, moving freely about in pursuit of their professions and receiving substantial grants of land to settle and pursue their, their arts. Families such as the O'Shenochs, best, whose best known descendant in Prince Edward Island was Lucy Maud Montgomery, came from Ireland and received valuable lands in Kintyre as harpers and bards to the Macdonald Lords of the Isles. The McPhees, who were record keepers to the Lordship and who once had numerous descendants in the West River area of PEI, were granted the island of Collinsay for their services. Other families, such as the Rankin Pipers, who have also have direct, and I should add, musical descendants here in Prince Edward Island, were granted their lands by the lieutenants of the Lords of the Isles. In this case, the Maclean's of Mull, who had in turn received their land as a reward for their part in the struggle against the Norse. This is a Gaelic account from Mull of their arrival in that territory. Quote, it is reported that Kuduli Rankin was the first piper in Mull. He is the same one I previously mentioned was instructed in music in Ireland. Then came to Mull with Lachlan Lubinach and Echen Ringenach. They were the first Maclean's to come into possession of the land of Mull. And when Kuleken, the son of the King of Norway, was banished from Dunkuleken, Kuduli began to teach pipe music in the first college of its sort that was in Scotland. That school was in Kilbrennan, beside Loch Tua. Just in case you don't know where Mall is. This is Iona, this is the island of Mall. This is Iona, this was the main center of the clan Donald's power. Essentially the old kingdom of Valeria at this period that began to incorporate the Norse islands as well. This was a great period of intercourse between Gaelic Scotland and Ireland. And so secure was the Lordship's reign in the Scottish West and in the Irish North, or Irish North, where they also held lands, that their principal stronghold at Finlagan in Isla was an unfortified administrative center. All that, however, was about to change for the worst. By the 16th century, as we can see from this map, Scotland was beginning to divide itself culturally between a thoroughly Gaelic Highlands and an increasingly Anglicized Lowlands, although you can see from this map that even in the 16th century, a significant area in the Lowlands was still completely Gaelic speaking. This division was obvi of obvious import, for the former Gaelic capital was now in these very Lowlands. When the King of Scots sought to consolidate control over his kingdom by destroying the Lordship of the Isles, his main rival, which he did by forfeiture in 1493, he did much more than simply change the political face of Scotland. An English ascendancy was now assured in Scotland, and the Gaelic West was plunged into a period of, dis of intense disorder, which lasted virtually up to the time the, the first Scottish Highland emigrants began leaving for Prince Edward Island and other destinations in the New World. This long period of decline was known in Gaelic as Lin Nencrech, the age of forays and plundering. The sense of what was to be lost was well conveyed by a poem composed at the beginning of this era by a poet lamenting the destruction of the Lordship of the Isles. Quote, In the van of Clan Donald, learning was commanded and in their rear were service and honor and self-respect. For sorrow and for sadness, I have forsaken wisdom and learning. On their account, I have forsaken all things. It is no joy without Clan Donald." Unquote. By the 16th century, Scottish Gaels were all too keenly and nervously aware of the encroaching power of England and of the parallels with the Irish Pale. Their desire to see Scotland remain free undivided and Gaelic, and their sense of a common cause with their fellow Gaels in Ireland 
was made abundantly clear in another poem from this very era. Just prior to the ill-flated ba Battle of Flodden in 1513, the chief poet to the Clan Didimich, or the Campbells, as they are better known in English, composed a battle incitement to the men of Argyll, urging them to join the King of Scots to drive the English out of Scotland. And the, the entire poem is quite, quite a brutal one. This is a small section of it. Quote, Towards Saxons I say to you, before they have taken our country, let us not yield to them, let us make mighty war against them, emulate the gale of Ireland, guard our fatherland, send your proclamation east and west for the gale from Ireland, send the Saxons backwards over the high sea, so that Scotland will not be divided anew. Unquote. The Gaelic poetic assessment of the threat the English posed to Scotland was a very insightful one, and that threat was about to grow much sharper teeth in the form of a new and even more aggressively English dynasty, the Tudors. The anti-Gaelic legislation of the 1300s had been a dismal failure in Ireland, and a startling Gaelic resurgence had so reduced the region in which English rule and law were obeyed that by 1537, the pale was restricted to a small area centered on Dublin. And you have to remember when the Normans first invaded, they had about three quarters of Ireland under their domain. And now the English law was followed only in Dublin itself. King Henry VIII was determined to reassert English control. And under the reign of this dynasty, clear, long-term, effective anti-Gaelic policies began to emerge. As his predecessors had done, Henry VIII portrayed the Irish as bad Catholics, disloyal to the Pope, unobservant of church doctrine, and generally backward and barbaric. He sought, and was granted, papal sanction to again invade Ireland and civilize the Gaels. Although Henry himself soon rejected the Pope's authority in most dramatic fashion, proclaiming himself head of the Church of England, and ushering in the Protestant Reformation in Britain, Nothing much changed for, for the Gaels. Now, the English didn't consider themselves Protestants at this period. They considered themselves Reformed Catholics. So they still feel, felt that the Gaels were bad Catholics. But once they began to develop a sense of being Protestant, then the Gaels became too Catholic. And had to be following the example set by his anti-Welsh legislation of the previous year. followed his example with enthusiastic brutality. By this time, Europe was already, already actively involved in the colonization of the Americas and in the African slave, tra slave trade. And Elizabeth I, who reigned from 1558 to 1603, began to adapt current thinking on those matters to, to devise policies for the Irish Gaelpa, most notably for a more forceful policy of colonizing it with loyal English-speaking Protestants. The military and cultural onslaught directed at the Gaels, particularly at Ireland, leading up to the union of the Scottish and English crowns in 1603, was awesome in its destructiveness. And we tend to be aware of England's colonial wars, or wars of this colonial period with the French and the Spanish, thinking of the defeat of the Spanish Armada, for example, under Queen Elizabeth's reign, and being we're a little less aware of what was going on in Ireland. In actual fact, at this time, no less than half of England's war budget was devoted to the destruction of the Gaels, or as the English termed it, the civilization of Ireland. Now, English chroniclers, particularly from this period, joined in on the anti-Gaelic campaign with great vigor, criticizing virtually every aspect of Gaelic life, including what they portrayed as uncivilized political structures, religious observances, the Gaelic inclination for barbarity, dishonesty, immorality, cruelty, and love of violence, as well as the backwardness of the Gaelic language and learning. They even went so far as to claim that the Irish were greatly inferior to the English in musical ability. <laughs> Gaelic scholars, such as Geoffrey Keating in Ireland and Neil and Cahill McVoody in Scotland, did their best to counter these unsubstantiated claims and set the record straight, but ultimately to no avail. 
the English bigotry was becoming far too deeply seated and the stakes were too high. Reading the literature produced in England during that period, one could be forgiven for thinking that the slaughter of men, women, and children and the stealing of lands and goods that resulted from England's attempts at colonization were actually being carried out in England by an invading band of Gales rather than the other way around. The following quote from the famed English literary figure Edmund Spencer is typical. Quote, they do use all the beastly behavior that may be. They oppress all men. They spoil as well the subject as the enemy. They steal. They are cruel and bloody, full of revenge and delighting in deadly execution. Licentious, swearers and blasphemers, common ravishers of women, and murderers of children." Unquote. To justify their actions in Ireland, which had no international backing or authority, the English had launched a campaign of propaganda which depicted the Gales as savages whose destruction was holy work. This thinking was starkly evident during the campaigns of the Earl of Essex in Ulster, which saw, incidentally, the massacre of 600 Scottish Gales on Rathbone Island, its entire population of men, women, and children. This is the territories that the Clan of Gaul still hold, held in Ireland, the Clan of Bachelor. A participant in the, car in the annihilation described the carnage the English were inflicting by concluding, How godly a deed it is to overthrow so wicked a race the world may judge. For my, for my part, I think there cannot be a greater sacrifice to God. It is hardly surprising that under the relentless pressure of the English juggernaut, Gaelic Ireland finally collapsed. The Irish rallied under the powerful chiefs of Ulster for one last Gaelic stand, but after an heroic nine-year campaign, their hopes were finally crushed at the Battle of Kinsale in 1601. Colin O'Buil of Aberdeen University describes the immediate aftermath. Quote, the Ulster chiefs came to an accommodation with London. Just as the new king, James VI, took up his English throne in 1603, they continued to hold their lands, but it was now by the grace of the king. They held on for some time, but in 1607, a body of over 100 gales, including O'Neill and O'Donnell, slipped away from Ireland secretly by ship for the continent. No one yet knows quite why, and the old Gaelic world in Ireland was manifestly over. This was the flight of the earls, remembered as one of the saddest days in Irish history. It was followed by the plantation of Ulster." Unquote. The loss of the native Gaelic leadership in Ireland ushered in a black period in Gaelic history. <coughs> An Irish poet expressed his sense of loss in Gaelic. Where have the Gaels gone? What is the fate of the mirthful throngs? I catch no glimpse of them within sight of the green land of the Gael. I do not see the dark-eyed throng around the heights of the fortified assembly place. Their tumult is not audible to me as I traverse Ireland's plain. I marvel what can be their condition, the heroes of the bright, pure fortresses. I have found the mansion of Khan's Ireland, but I cannot find the companies of her halls. They have been dispersed from us in all directions, the young warriors of Leinster, the heroes of Munster, the fierce-bladed denizens of Maeve's Plain and ancient Evan's warband of noble race. They have been giving, given billeting far and wide, away from bright, smooth Ireland. The palaces of kings, or the eastern lands, are made well known to the race of Miu. We have in their stead an arrogant, impure crowd of foreigners' blood of the race of Monag. There are Saxons there and Scotch. Here is an analogy for the land of Banava, a golden chessboard under base chessmen. For some time, our land has been found destitute of its bright complement of gales. Concentrating primarily in Ulster, arguably the most Gaelic region of Ireland, and the crucial linchpin between the Scottish and Irish Gaeltachs, and beginning in 1609, an intensive organized plantation of Ireland began. Catholics in Ireland, in other words, the vast bulk of the native Gaelic population, were now to be denied the legal right to own land anywhere 
in the country other than to the west of the River Shannon in the province of Connaught or in County Clare, and attempts were made to clear them from the rest of the country. This rock area here is the rockiest, rockiest, most poorly suited to agriculture in Ireland. <clears throat> in practice, the attempt to segregate Catholics from the Protestant colonists by moving them to the inferior lands of the West was not very successful, but the effects on Gaelic society were no less dramatic for their <clears throat> failure. The population of the, of the country was reduced by roughly half. More than half a million people died and something like 100,000 were sent as slaves to work in the camps of the Caribbean and in the Americas. Those who were not forced to hell or connaught, as the Ang English described their Irish policy, were generally pushed as tenants onto inferior pieces of land within their own home districts. Well before the end of the 18th century, Catholics had been reduced from owning 95% of the land in Ireland to a mere 5%. There, deprived of their rightful property, descending into increasing poverty, they remained angry and disaffected. Now of these 40,000 <coughs> 40, Gaels in Ireland during this period left to took ser service on the continent, mostly as soldiers in the armies of various kings. Apparently, according to some information I just discovered, my ancestors were among them. According to the history of Antigonish County, two of these fighting men from Ireland were invited to join forces with the Keppoch MacDonalds in Loch Haber. These two Kennedy brothers not only received a substantial piece of land at Lenachan, but were married into the chief's family as in an effort to cement the ties between the chief and his new cadets. Now, I recently discovered from a Gaelic-speaking historian in Loch Haber that the area where the party was held to welcome the Kennedys to Scotland is still known to Gales today as the field of the dance. The Gales who were left behind in Ireland, however, had little reason for such happy celebration. The fall of Ireland in 1601 <coughs> was the beginning of the downfall of the Gaelic world in Ireland, and the rest of the 17th century continued the process. In Scotland, however, protected by the fortresses of the Highlands, and strongly supported by local chiefs such as the Keppoch MacDonalds. The remnants of that Gaelic world were to remain substantially intact for another century and a half, right up until the first emigrants began leaving for Canada. This partially explains why so many of the greatest Gaelic tradition bearers on our side of the Atlantic were Scots and not Irish, as we might otherwise have expected. However, the survival of the Gaelic world in Scotland was just that, a mere survival, a desperate clinging on to life and not the strong, vigorous evolution of the past, an evolution which was absolutely necessary if Gaelic would have any hope of the future. Without the traditional interaction with Ireland, local Highland chiefs could not long support the entire Gaelic cultural, educational, and religious institutions on their own, particularly as they were now increasingly the target of the English political and cultural onslaught. Unlike the ferocious anti-Gaelic campaigns in Ireland, however, the crushing of Gaelic Scotland would be a slow but inexorably tightening death grip. Just as the Scottish Gaelic poets had predicted, the growing strength of England had created a Scottish pale and effectively divided Scotland, making it ripe for absorption. An absorption which occurred in 1603 with the union of the Scottish and English crowns and the accession of James VI of Scotland as James I of the United Kingdom of England, Wales, and Scotland. Unfortunately, lowland Scots, such as King James, now looked upon Highlanders with the same derision and hatred as the English in the Irish Pale had looked upon the Irish Gaels. The Gaelic heritage, which had underpinned Scotland's declaration of independence in 1320, was now disavowed in the centers of power in the lowlands. Not surprisingly, as the Gaelic poets had predicted, so too was independence from England. Quote, the court of James VI had little sympathy for Gaeldom. Alexander Montgomery, the most accomplished of the poets of the Castalian band, made fun of the Irish legends of the origins of kings of Scots, which had held place 
as late as the reigns of James V, as late as the reign of James V. How the first Helen man of God was made of a horse turd in Argyle, it is said. By the 1590s, a counterculture of British identity had already emerged at the Stuart Court, which looked askance at Gaelic culture. After 1603, the natural enemies of Union would be lumped together as Papists, Irish, Borderers, and Highlanders." Unquote. As enemies of the United Kingdom, Scottish Gaels, like their fellow Gaels in Ireland, had to be civilized. King James was not able to repeat his plantation of Ulster in the Highlands, although ten years earlier he had proposed sending Scottish Highlanders to, as slaves to the Caribbean in order to make way for just such a colonizing effort. Instead, James had to content himself with enacting the infamous Statutes of Iona in 1609. Scottish historian Michael Lynch explains, The legislation embodied in the Statutes of Iona of that year unequivocally stigmatized what it called Irish manners, dress, and customs. It forced clan chiefs to have their eldest sons or daughters educated on the mainland, safely removed from barbarous influences, and taught to speak, read, and write in English. The statutes were subscribed by nine chiefs who had been forcibly abducted for this purpose." Unquote. King James' policy of forcing an English Protestant education onto Gaelic children was reinforced and extended in 1616 by the first piece of specifically educational legislation following the Reformation, an act for the settling of parochial schools. Its declared aim was, quote, that the vulgar English tongue be universally planted, and the Irish language, which is one of the chief and principal causes of the continuance of barbarity and incivility amongst the inhabitants of the Isles and Highlands, may be abolished and removed, unquote. In 1688, even after the Stuart monarchy had deposed, the grip tightened further, quote, after the revolution of 1688, the Whigs began the repression of Gaelic in earnest. One of the earliest actions of King William was to grant the rents of the suppressed bishopric of Argyll and the Islands to the Synod of Argyll for the purpose of, quote, erecting of English schools for rooting out the Irish language and other pious uses, unquote. Highland tenants, who were unwilling to pay rents for what was, in fact, an attack on their language and religion, were to be punished by having soldiers quartered on, upon them until payment was made." Unquote. By 1710, the Society in Scotland for the Propagation of Christian Knowledge, SSPCK as it was known, was formed to intensify the efforts to turn Gaelic children into good English Protestants. Quote, Nothing can be more effectual for reducing these countries, in other words the Highlands and the Islands, to order and making them useful to the commonwealth than teaching them their duty to God, their king and country, and rooting out their Irish language." Unquote. It was during this period that the term Kletjif Avatavuya, the faith of the yellow stick, emerged in Gaelic Scotland to describe the arrests, evictions, deportations, economic and legal repression, threats of execution, and general techniques of coercion and intimidation that the Church of Scotland was using to force Gales to convert. In Prince Edward Island, we are most familiar with the term the faith of the yellow stick in association with the Glenaldale settlers who came here from the Catholic island of South Uist in 1772. But the term was actually first in use in areas which, were, which are now either entirely Protestant or entirely depopulated. Testament to the options available to Gales at that time. In spite of the relentless nature of these anti-Gaelic policies, authorities had moved with some caution. The semi-independence of the Highland chiefs and the reputation of Highland swords still inspired a degree of fear in the South. However, all that was about to change when the sporadic attempts to restore the Stuart monarchy culminated in the last Jacobite Rising in 1745. <coughs> Although the Irish and the Scottish Highlanders played an undeniably important role in the Jacobite army during the 45, and although the distinctiveness of Highland dress, the effectiveness of the Highland charge, 
and the successful campaigns through Scotland and England rejuvenated old fears and prejudice, prejudices. What the Jacobite rising really revealed was the vulnerability of Gaelic Scotland. There would be no mass Gaelic rising as authorities had seemed to fear in the past. Indeed, during the 1745 rising, Gaels were well represented in the opposing Hanoverian forces. It was, after all, simply a dynastic, a dynastic dispute. Most Gaels did not get involved at all. When the rising failed on Culloden Moor in April 1746, however, the smallness of the Gaelic representation in the rebel force gave the government regime both the excuse and the confidence to turn Culloden into a symbolic Kinsale, indiscriminately attacking the inhabitants of the Highlands and preparing the final nails for Gaelic's coffin. According to Scottish historian Michael Lynch, quote, what was inevitable was the aftermath of the 45. Cumberland's savage orders to harry, burn, and kill men, women, and children alike in a campaign of mass reprisal after Culloden was unusual in 18th century warfare. But it was no more than a repeat performance of the final Elizabethan conquest of Ireland after 1601, when, as here, the bloodletting came after 40 years of frustration and failure in dealing with the Celtic people. It was one more act in the long drama of the consolidation of an English empire." Unquote. Whatever autonomy time Gaelic society may once have enjoyed, it was quickly swept away in the aftermath of the 45. The clan system had been rendered redundant, both by events and by specific legislation. Legislation was also enacted which forbade Gaels from bearing any weapons and from wearing Highland dress. The Gael Thoft was inundated with English-speaking officials, including schoolmasters and Presbyterian ministers, with all their institutional hatred of Gaelic and Catholicism. The Gaelic elite, which had, which had begun looking more and more to the south as a model for development since the 17th century, now had little choice but to accept their new role as commercial landlords in the Highlands, or to follow the example of the flight of the Earls in 1607 and go into exile. With this fundamental change in the structure of Gaelic society, the last remnants of independent patronage of Gaelic learning and artistic expression were swept away. What had begun in Ireland in 1601 at Kinsale ended in Scotland at Culloden Moor in 1746. The Clown Bully, the famous Rankin Pipers, who had opened the first college, piping college in Scotland, were only one of many learned families who were forced to cease practicing their art over the course of this, this era of repression, closing Scotland's oldest piping college in 1757 before emigrating to Prince Edward Island. An account in Gaelic from an historian in Mull laments, echoes the laments of the poets of Ireland in the aftermath of Kinsale. Quote, that was the first time in 500 years at least that Mull was out without a rank in playing the pipes. A song was made by the de song was made about the decline of the clan Dooley, but I am sorry to say that I am unable to obtain anything but one stanza and the chorus. Destroyed, destroyed, destroyed completely. Clan Dooley the pipers destroyed completely. When it was time to tune their pipes, melodious would be the song, and they would raise a tune lightly in company. Destroyed, destroyed, destroyed completely. Clan Dooley the pipers destroyed completely it might well have been the requiem for the Gaelic world. When the Rankins and their fellow Gaels from Scotland and Ireland deported for Prince Edward Island and other de destinations in the New World in the 18th and 19th centuries, they were leaving behind a Gaelic order whose roots stretched back to antiquity and whose contribution to Western civilization had been a distinguished one. But it was a world plummeting towards its final collapse, culturally repressed and brutally stigmatized as a failure divided now by religion, political allegiance, and increasingly, and ironically, by language, as Gaelic slowly slipped away, and slipping below even the basic means of survival into horrific impoverishment, famine, and mass starvation. But as the earliest Prince Edward Island Gaelic immigration songs indicate, Gael saw the New World as a chance to break free from their oppressors and start their lives afresh. Rory Mackenzie, a member of what was left of the Scottish Gaelic nobility, 
contemplated leaving Scotland for Prince Edward Island in 1803 with the Selkirk settlers. And having reached his conclusion, he sang out in Gaelic, It is necessary to burst forth from this land to go to wooded America where there will be freedom and peace. The spirit of defiance and independence these earliest Gaelic settlers brought to this land was a sure sign that Gaelic's last stand had not yet come. That, however, is a story for another time. Thank you very much. Quite a sweep of history covered there in, in a compar comparatively short period of time. Any questions for our speaker tonight? Feel free to uh, to hold forth. I think it is, it is possible. Uh, the problem, we've got a, a dual problem. One, the Gaelic world has been so heavily assimilated, so you lose all that information um, because we really instituted illiteracy back into the, the Gaelic world back in the 1600s. We wiped out the native tradition of learning. We had nobody to write our history. So you have that problem, that the material is, is weak, it's lacking, and what is there is in Gaelic. Most people can't speak the language now and have difficulty accessing it. The other problem is that we were assimilated by the culture that destroyed our, our own. So you run into the problems like all this justification I was talking about that was, that was an act at the time. It still colors the way people see things. Now, this is not unique to the Gaelic world by any stretch of the imagination. It's part of just imperial discourse. When people want to take land from somebody, they have to justify why they're going to do that. Um, but it's it's starting to, the tide is turning in a lot of other areas. You, you can see things now. In, in Canada, people are, are kind of throwing off that idea of, like, for instance, native cultures being a bunch of savages who, you know, who were saved by, by Britain arriving on the scene. It's not happening very fast concerning the Gales. It is happening in Ireland. I, be, I think partly because they have political independence, they've always kept that idea of being Gales and being proud of that. In Scotland, they've really been absorbed to a large extent. The idea of, of Gaelic being the ancestral language of Scotland it was a good way to get you into a fight in the bar in, in Edinburgh, I can tell you. Um, so you run into a lot of institutional problems there. Uh, the only way to do it is to get into the Gaelic sources for, and start looking at them. People have not done that. Uh, when you get into them, you start to find out a lot of the truths about the history, what people were experiencing and what they felt about it. So you get a chance to tell the other side of a very complicated story. And I think that still can be done. We're lucky if we have UPEI, the way cutbacks are going nowadays. It's, um, it's certainly deserved, but Prince Edward Island is, the, I think, perhaps the only state outside of Scotland or Ireland that, that is, had a predominantly Gaelic population. And as I showed you with that slide in the 19th century there, uh, certainly Scottish Gaelic, it's hard to say because we don't know how much Gaelic the Irish settlers were speaking. I know some of them were speaking Irish and some weren't speaking any. Uh, Scottish Gaelic may have been the predominant language, but it's very difficult to say. So it certainly is a good claim to that kind of study, but it's it's very difficult these times to get that kind of support. Just in a way of a comment that we've heard to the enumeration of the ethnic origin of Canadians 
And obviously, the decline in the supposed numbers of the Scots and Irish in Prince Edward Island is not that everybody left. It's because people have lost their memory about where they came from. And that's our responsibility, not the government, to teach our kids where we came from. And so we do have something that we can all do. And I have a feeling the people that are here this evening don't need to be told. It's the rest of us out in the countryside. But one question that I had, I guess, revolves a little bit around the fact that the imperialism of the English, or whatever you want to call them, the Saxons, which the Irish like to call them. Um, That's the Gaelic the word for English, just to clarify, is Sassanach has never changed, which comes from that ancient period of Saxon, so you still, it's not particularly derisive when they say Saxon, it's just the, the traditional terms. Okay. Um, the Scots use it derisively every chance they get. <laughs> I have heard it argued that the Scots and the Irish or the Gaels were perhaps not as far along the, the evolution towards a nation state as the Normans were, and that put them behind the eight ball when they came under the aggression or imperialism of the Normans and English, making them less uh, united and less able to resist those incursions. Do you agree with that, or do you think there's any validity in that? Or if not, can you explain why the Irish and the Scots were so vulnerable? Yeah, well, this, this is very complicated. I'll try to keep it concise, but um, at the time of the Norman invasion, there wasn't really a nation state in Europe, it was just kind of coming into its own. Now, when the Gaelic dynasty went extinct, I said at the end of the uh, 13th century, launching the Scottish Wars of Independence, it was at that time the oldest reigning monarchy in the Christian world. So there was a good continuity of government there. Um, was, the, but, what, was there a concept of the, you know, the people as the nation yeah, well, state? This is, this I'm not saying that the Normans were a nation state, but mm -hmm. further along the evolution. Well, this is what was evolving, this idea of, of a country and a people. But, but the problem isn't so much the perception, it's, it's, it was the economic structure. Now, Ireland and Scotland predominantly are a good cattle country, they're good for grazing, which was the most primitive form of agriculture. Even today, this is the kind of agriculture that predominates in the area. And uh, the, the Scottish lowlands to the east there are very fertile and good for arable farming, but, but, but the, only after we got better technology. At that stage, you couldn't. So that was the kind of econ economic base that was in Scotland and Ireland. England had richer, richer soil. They had settled agriculture, settled districts. So they're building what we kind of consider the modern agricultural economy. So they had a more organized economic structure in that fashion, more, more sedentary. But the thing you have to remember when you talk about the weakness of the Ireland and Scotland is it took the Normans one day to defeat England <laughs> because everything was in place. All you had to do was destroy the leadership and it was all yours. Because, because of the kind of moving around in, in the Gaelic world and that the, the smaller scale of organization, it made it very difficult to, to, to absorb. The same is true of Wales as well. It took, took centuries. It took roughly about 400 years for them to, to absorb the Welsh. Um, so, when you're thinking of the, of the uh, Gaels as a people, culturally they were united. The church was one of the main institutions that united them, and their school system also united them. They had a common language. Again, like in, all throughout Europe, you would have had a series of small dialects and so on that might be loosely called German or English, but one person at one end of a country, another person at another end, would have considerable difficulty understanding each other as time went on and it's that, that area that they inhabited expanded. Uh, so schools and the media nowadays kind of keep our language, a common language that we all more or less understand. In Scotland, they had a language like that. It was called classical Gaelic. All the scholars, all the, the important leaders understood this language, and it was in existence right up until the mid-1600s when the schools were finally wiped out. Um, so that also served as glue. The people who were traveling back and forth, all the Gaels in Scotland went to Ireland to study a lot of them came from there, and Irish as well, back to Scotland to do their kind of internship. So this kind of kept the, the, the nations, sort of a sense of themselves as a people, at least as a Gael, Gaels anyway. Over here. I 
I couldn't. I don't ask me to, to get into John Major's head and tell you what he's thinking. But the, uh, I, I, I'm not really sure what's going on. There's a lot of funny things happening in Europe now and in, in Britain as well. They're talking about home rule as well. For you know, both parties are talking about it now, as far as I'm aware. And uh, I, I don't know if I'd really want to comment. I was there for five years in Scotland. It's it's a very interesting political kind of a carry on right now. But uh, it's it's very it, it's it, it, the confusions and you know about culture and about uh, identity and about political arrangements and so on are really astonishing, I find. Uh, you know, the debate in Scotland right now is over a, a parliament without tax-raising power. So in other words, they're aspiring to have less power than Prince Edward Island. That's the kind of goal, and Scotland's still defined as a country, but they have really nothing much that, that of the kind of typical institutions that would define you as a country anymore. But these are the kind of things that are really, really amazing debates that are going on there at the moment. Well, the, uh, the, the Gaelic adopted a, essentially a Roman alphabet when they started. They had, uh, there is some talk about these old scripts you may have heard of that were carved in stone. When they started actually writing on paper, they used the modified Roman alphabet. Uh, it has 18 letters rather than 26. So it has, uh, it cut out a lot of the redundancy. We don't have, you know, like X, C, and K. They, they have, they, they get rid of that. Uh, there's a few differences in, in how you combine sounds. Most of the letters have the same value as English would, but there are a few few differences. Uh, there was also a Gaelic script as well, which was similar to, to Roman, but it was uniquely Gaelic. That lasted along with the common classical Gaelic right up until about the time of the 45. Uh, Alistair McVeistert Alistair is considered one of the greatest of Gaelic poets, and he was a, a famous Jacobite poet. He could write in the Gaelic script, and it's a shame I don't actually have that book with me. I have an example of that, that script. He could write in that script, and he knew classical Gaelic. And his nieces and nephews emigrated to PEI. So right from that period, there is that, still that connection. Sorry. What is the name Well, there would be, I don't know who they've married in with, but it was, no, Mac, it was McDonald's around the, no. the Scotsford and Trackety area that came over. I don't actually know. I don't I haven't traced the family out yet. I'd be interested to find out who actually came. I think Michael was. Uh, is married to Donald Gregory? I think you're right. Donald McDonald yeah. Alistair. Yeah. Uh, James McDonald Portage. Those were the things that happened. Yeah, and I'm just not sure if anybody else came. I know. I know the, the, his sister's people came, but I, I think there are more yet than we than we previously knew as well. I'd like to find out more about them. I think there was a question there. Yeah, Michael, last week, uh, Justice William Kelly gave a review of uh, Irish law that dates back to the third and fourth centuries called the Breton Code. Do you see any elements of that in Scotland in these centuries that passed? Have you heard of it? Or? Well, um, I don't, I'm not familiar that familiar with the Brand Law Code. Um, it was an ancient system of laws that were enacted orally, and they were passed down quite quite complex laws and very very interesting laws. There is some uh, belief that they are part of a common evolution of Europe. Like all language, most of the languages of Europe evolved from a common language. Um, some of these laws seem to fit in very well with what we see in India, even the the Brahmin. The Brahmins were, the, I guess, the lawgivers in India, and so on. There's, there's arguments that these are that ancient, you know, that they, they represent kind of a, an evolution from that period. But one of the, the targets of, of repression or assimilation were the Irish laws. Now they would have governed anywhere where Gaelic was spoken when people had this common idea of, of themselves as Gaels. But uh, I think they, they disappeared fairly early with the, with the intense repression. But I don't know that much about them, about you know how they were actually enacted. There were Gaelic, Gaelic lawyers and judges and so on, but, but that, that was wiped out as well. And it's very difficult for us now to look back after three or four hundred years after those professions ceased functioning and try to work out what they actually did and how they, how they handled their trade. So. Two questions. Was there a significant history of color coding in the Irish PDI? Oh, uh, the, of the Gaelic settlements? Yeah. The, the, basically, they're the, the main regions of, of emigration identified. I'll just put it on for It's not the best. I've got, I'm afraid I've got the two colors have kind of merged, almost the red and the orange. But uh, <laughs> I 
uh, essentially the color codes are uh, the blue areas, or kind of, well they're actually the purple areas, are the people who came out from the Isle of Skye. Uh, Sky and Rassi and the adjacent mainland, all, they all seem to settle together almost everywhere they went. The red areas are Catholic, Catholic settlements. Uh, I'll distinguish them from the orange in a second. But, um, the green areas were from Perthshire, the main settlement areas, and, and the blue areas were from Sutherland. And I'll just point out, I'll distinguish the red and orange here. This area, is, this is where the main Catholic settlement began. They spread out along the coast here and filled inland. There's also early Catholic settlement around this area. Uh, some down here, but it never amounted to much. There was a big plan for a huge settlement here. The, the uh, chief was going to bring the people out, had to sell one of his islands to, to uh, get the money for it. And there's a tradition in Gaelic uh, where, where actually the chief or the person giving the land to someone else actually physically picks up a handful of soil and gives it to the other person after the transaction's been carried out. He did this going back to the mainland of Squall, but his, his vessel was drowned. So that plan fell, fell apart. A couple of his brothers and sisters came out. Uh, later on, some of these people moved up to the Bray area. I, I'm not sure that there may have been some in-migration as well. This orange area was uh, Argyle people. They also moved there from inside PEI. Their first settlements were here, the West River area, and down along the Belfast, Belfast district. And you had mixed Perser and Argyle settlements here. Some Perser people here. This area, Sutherland, one of the latest and smallest of the groups. Little Perser group up here. Too. I think there's a lot of that. In fact, in that 1971 census, they, they're trying to figure out what went wrong. Because this is the first time that, that somebody didn't come around and actually take your, your information, explain to you what everything meant. And that was one of the conclusions that possibly people were confusing language with ethnicity. Uh, it's hard to say. I think, I think there's a bit of that, but I think there's something about identity as well. Um, I think that comes with speaking English. You know, we, a lot of us now have been speaking English for generations, and you, you start to make those associations. And I think there's also a, a kind of a, a I've seen this like in the, the Canadian Ethnic Studies Associ Association, the, the, the series I quoted from. They use British and English interchangeably, so you're more or less taught that growing up. And, and that's actually what I was hoping to talk a bit about tonight: that how that that kind of images, those images were manipulated intentionally and just by a matter of course. Um, but I, I know I've, I've looked at community histories, I've gone through just about every one, well, every one I could get my hands on, and I'm surprised how often I'd see somebody say, um, you know, Donald and Ronald McDonald came out from South Lewis in 1772, the first English-speaking settlers to arrive in PEI in this area. <laughs> I thought, well, if Donald and Ronald McDonald recognized English, they'd be doing pretty well. <laughs> This is a really interesting question. The historians are really wrestling with this because nobody can figure out what happened to them. Uh, the Picts were a powerful force. The <coughs> Romans never conquered the Picts. They, they drove the, the border up to about the border of, of modern-day Scotland. They built Hadrian's Wall. They tried to go up the above, above to the Firth of Forth and the Firth of Clyde, and they built Antonine's Wall, but they could never hold that. And that territory there was actually occupied by the Britons, the people they had beaten in the south, who were very closely related to the Picts. But they tried as they might. They could not really break Caledonia. In 843, when Kenneth MacAlpin became the king of the Picts and the Scots, they all of a sudden disappeared. The whole north of Scotland became Gaelic speaking, and nobody's really sure exactly what happened. They figure they were weakened by Norse attacks, and they, there's a possibility that they intentionally joined with the Gaels. Uh, they had invited Gaels over because of their scholarship and their learning, and they were. It seems like the uh, the royal lines were united for many, many generations before this sort of official merger. 
So it's hard to say exactly what happened. If, the, if, the, if there was bat there were battles, there's no doubt. But, but the final unification, no, nobody's really sure. It's, it's quite a mystery. Well, again, just to be uh, a devil's advocate, if we didn't have all the documentation, if we didn't know all the details of the struggle between England and Scotland, between 1300 and 1700, we could quite as easily say, for some reason, they just assimilated. Well, absolutely. There's no doubt. But I mean, they have a good idea. That this is the strange thing. The thing is, why did it happen the way it happened? Uh, and it was a period of good relations, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence of fighting. It just seems to suddenly, this was now Scotland. It's, it's a very complicated thing, even that what, they, what they call the area. It's it just got people baffled. But it, that's true. And if you look at Ireland's history, too, there's the old legends, Irish legends, they talk about waves of people coming in and invading. And it's become legendary. They're almost they're superheroes and they're they're you know magic people. But but uh, archaeologists are actually confirming most of these legends in in the main at its heart. You know that there were groups of people in before, and then another wave would come in who spoke a different language, and uh, and the Gael seemed to have been the last who came in and really stamped this place as it's uh, you know Ireland. It's a Gaelic country. So that's what what we're talking about here is essentially we know these places as these places. And we still have the, the terms and, the, and the, the sense that these mean something for identity, but that's all changed. What it means has changed. That's the difference now, I suppose, that we do know the past. Yes, there's many people who say it's been five years Well, I find, uh, I've been in a few places, well, I've been most most parts of Scotland, I found a real similarity in the people in, in the Highlands and in Ireland as well with people in the island. They're very similar in their personalities, and uh, as soon as they find out you're from, from here, if they know anything about it, a lot of people don't know anymore, but uh, if people do, they, they welcome you instantly as one of their own. Uh, but what surprised me was, for us, these emigrations were important. Like, I can tell you that my, I can tell you all my family when they came, because that's a point I can mark. I can say that my mother's family left Skye in 1803. But for the people in Skye, this was happening constantly. So they don't remember these immigrations. They're going everywhere. For us, we, we know we're looking at this one place. We look back sort of like this, but for them, they're looking out at this. And I was surprised that if you want to get good traditions on emigration, on old history, you've got to do it here or in Cape Breton or places like that. In Scotland, the, the memories are not as good, although there are some outstanding historians and so on that can, that can tell you, local historians, I mean. Um, but I, I, I was told a story. I went to visit a fellow in Skye. This was kind of interesting. Uh, somebody told me to go down and visit, said he'd, he'd like to speak to me, and I, uh, I arrived at the post. I think, no, I just somebody drove me down, and his door was open. They don't have a problem with black flies and mosquitoes in the summer like we do, so their doors are usually open in the summer. He came out to the door and he was on crutches. He was about 84 and he had arthritis. And uh, I came out of the car and he, he saw me and he said, Oh, hello, come and ask you. I said, Oh, how about and ask you, babe? And he just got Nikostoy and he didn't know who I was. He had no idea who I was. And he was speaking way to me in Gaelic. And my well, Gaelic's not that strong, but I was trying to follow him. We got inside, sat down, talked for a while, and he realized he didn't know who he was. He thought it was somebody else. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't phase him, didn't stop his conversation, he carried on. <laughs> We talked all afternoon. Anyway, he told me the thing I was going to get at is he told me that when he was younger, he was known as a good Gaelic singer. And uh, there was a song composed not far from where I live in Cape Breton now by a, a man named Malcolm Gillis. And Molian Down the Hooray, it's called. And uh, he sang that for the first time in the Isle of Skye at a community gathering. He said you could hear a pin drop. People were just in love with the song. So when the Gaelic was there, that connection was still there. But it's starting to fade because Gaelic is disappearing pretty fast in these areas too. They're Scotland is following the game. <laughs> this one's easier to put back up, though. I think. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Well, it's not really lecture here tonight. I think the numbers that turned out and the questions that we got uh, really indicate the interest that is there. And maybe we'll do a follow-up lecture uh, next year, continue on from where, where we stopped tonight. So once again, uh, thank you very much on behalf of everyone. <laughs>
Before we break for a bit of lunch and some tea and coffee, uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, St. Patrick's Banquet is on here tomorrow evening. There are still a few tickets left. Anyone who's interested in attending that. Our guest speaker is, is Marion Reed. Uh, and I believe Alan Malmo at the back of the hall has some tickets for anyone who's interested. Um, for all those who are Irish, and you don't have to be Irish, for all those who like to parade, the, uh, the BIS parade is on this Sunday. We're meeting at uh, the uh, Basilica Recreation Center at uh, 10 o'clock. Linda's holding up something there. I can't read that. <laughs> oh, yes, I see. She, she's reminding me to remind you to sign your name uh, before you leave. Those of you who haven't signed your name, uh, get on our mailing list for future lectures and, and other activities. Uh, back to the parade on Sunday. Anyone who is interested in parading, you don't have to be a member of the society.